Right, hello everyone and a very warm welcome to Dame Melanie Dawes, appointed Chief Executive of Ofcom, it seems a very, very long time ago now, <laughs> but in truth, only back in February last year, but the coronavirus pandemic and subsequent lockdown have aged us all, I suspect. <laughs> As if regulating the BBC, the upcoming media white paper, policing the internet, potential privatization of Channel 4, no permanent chair at Ofcom, and now a new culture secretary in Nadine Doris, were not enough to focus the mind. Like an endless procession of Bush Tucker trials. <laughs> Without the consolation of an exotic location, Southwark Bridge, to be exact. Impressive, experienced, Nobody's fool, relaxed, charming, and with the kind of confidence that puts you at ease. These just some of the descriptions of Dame Melanie's qualities from former civil service colleagues and others in the media industry. Qualities surely needed to steer Ofcom through a challenging media landscape, to say the very least. A devotee of Strictly Come Dancing, just how nimble-footed <laughs> will you be in navigating a now tortuous media world and trying to grab maximum points from the industry and the public, as well as the government. Welcome. Thank you, Clive. Um, we're going to be chatting for about 25 minutes. Then, towards the end, five minutes or so, some questions. So please, think them up. It would be good to have your points of view coming across. Now, have you had past dealings with the new culture secretary? No, I haven't met her. I look forward to meeting her. Um, I think she's got a great job brilliant range of things that DCMS does, but I look forward to our first meeting. Okay. Well, what have you heard about it? Um, well, I mean, you know, nothing in particular um, <laughs> that I'm prepared to uh, talk about. Um, <laughs> but no, I mean, look, I, I, I've been a permanent secretary myself, and I, yeah. I always feel for a department when they've got a lot of change, and I know uh, she's got some great civil servants who'll be supporting her through these next, uh, these next few weeks as she gets to grips with, uh, as I said, a brilliant but very wide-ranging and interesting brief. Okay. How would you characterise what you believe your relationship should be with the DCMS? Yeah, well, look, we are an independent regulator. And, you know, when Ofcom is making decisions on the areas where Parliament has, you know, given us that, uh, that, that role, that, that set of rules, things like, you know, uh, the decisions we make on TV complaints, but also what we do, and uh, Lutz was referring to this earlier, the 10-year the investment framework that we um, published uh, earlier this year for telecoms. When we're making those kind of regulatory decisions which have an impact on companies, on consumers, we are scrupulously independent. Um, everything we do is based on evidence, on consultation, and that's because what we do can and often is challenged in the courts, and it has to stand up to a really, really high threshold of fact-based, clear decision-making. Um, but there are also times where we're providing advice to the government, um, and there I think a good example is what we've done recently on public service media, where we've done a huge amount of work, again, evidence-based, but we're actually setting out really clear recommendations to the government on where we think the regulatory framework needs to change to support the industry into the future, and I'm, I'm, I'm you know, really pleased that the government's picking up those recommendations, um, and I hope still taking them forward. But you know as well as I do, some argue that that independence, it's actually on the line. There's no permanent Ofcom chair mm -hmm. yet, um, though it seems the government knows who it would like in that seat. Channel 4 is missing board members. Again, the government seems to know the kind of person that it would like to see in those roles. Do you share the concerns of some about Ofcom's independence? Well, look, I really don't have any concerns about Ofcom's independence. No, at all. And I, no I really don't. And you know, whoever our new chair is, um, uh, and you know, I'm sure the government will appoint one um, at some point in the coming months. Um, it's a decision for them. It's a government appointment. Um, the moment you walk into Ofcom, that independence is just such an important part of our DNA. And I've sort of explained why. You know, it's because actually what we do is make decisions that get challenged in the courts. That's our, that's our business. Um, but it's also really important, I think, particularly in relation to television and radio, actually, that, that the decisions we're making are about freedom of speech. 
And that raises really important democratic questions of people's fundamental rights to freedom of expression and how you weigh those against the need to uphold standards in the broadcasting code. Um, so on, on those decisions in particular, I think an independent regulator is especially important. It's something I know Parliament prizes very highly. And it's, just, it's just something that hits you between the eyes when you first arrive in Ofcom. Yeah, I mean, you've, you've said that before, haven't you? That um, you'd be really surprised if any new chair arriving at Ofcom didn't feel that sense of independence. I mean, have you ever met Paul Dacre? <laughs> Pass. <laughs> I'm allowed to do that once. Um. <laughs> <laughs> All right, okay. Um, let's move on then to public service broadcasting. And we had a, a fascinating session a little bit earlier so, sort of looking at that. Um, Ofcom published in July its 70-page review of public service broadcasting. And you're quoted as saying it's the biggest shake-up in PSBs for 20 years. So what's your action plan? Well, look, I mean, um, I, don't, I don't remember quite saying that, actually, but I, I think um, this was a really big piece of work from Ofcom over about 18 months. And, um, you know, uh, we, uh, really interesting, the earlier session, talking about some of the, the challenges for the industry with all the change. I mean, massive disruption going on from digital technologies, from digital platforms coming in with that global might into our UK industry. Uh, in a way that's fantastic for the viewer, but it's also really challenging for you know, the services that we all really love, and particularly for that British-based content that we know that viewers and listeners really value. But in our review, it was actually really great to be able to point to the cut path full here, which is that viewers and listeners really do value what they get from the PSBs at the moment. They see the difference between what they get from ITV, oh, sorry, um, ITV, Channel 4, uh, STV, BBC, they see the difference between that and what's often a more global product that's enjoyable, but it's just not quite as engaging uh, as, as what you get from what's on, you know, what's been produced by our own homegrown broadcasters. So, you know, we came up with a, a, a bunch of recommendations, including critically what we think needs to be a, 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 quite a big change in the regulatory framework, essentially to go digital in a number of different respects, make that shift from linear broadcasting towards media that's more flexibly, more flexibly accessed and viewed by uh, people on different channels and different, on different devices and so on. But the PSBs, they're valuable, they're important, and some would argue uh, uh, life-saving when it came to getting news and information out there concerning the pandemic over the last few Absolutely. Months. I mean, it was really, um, obviously, not. I wouldn't have planned to arrive in Ofcom and go into lockdown two weeks later. Yeah. Um, and there are other people in the room who I know started their jobs in lockdown too. And, you know, it's a particular type of challenge. But you do get to see what an industry and a sector is about. And I'd say the same about telecoms, actually. They kept the lights on. They kept the networks going. Lutz was right about that earlier. But on, I think... Our broadcasters have had a great year. We saw, you know, all-time highs really over any recent past in viewing figures last, you know, March, April time. And we've seen trust in news on UK TV rise back up again to around 70%. And, and that's, that was particularly heartening to see. People have, again, viewers and listeners have really seen the value that their trusted news sources have brought in navigating with all the uncertainties of the pandemic. And did the pandemic highlight any weaknesses? In PSB. Well, I think it, it, it demonstrated for me the kind of overall commercial imperatives that we've been talking about in this conference in the last couple of days, the, mm -hmm. the, need, to, the need to shift to digital, the need to, you know, the challenge of standing out when there's so much other content available. Um, so I think it, you know, it, not just in broadcasting, actually in, in so many industries, the disruption took another leap forward and the change took another leap forward. As I said, I think actually the industry, and I really do take my hat off to um, all those who've led companies through the pandemic mm. in this industry with all the logistical issues around production, all the challenges of advertising revenue and so on. It's been, I mean, it's been searing for anyone in a leadership role, but um, I, I, I'm very impressed by, by, by just how everyone's come through so well. Sure, I mean, it's interesting though, isn't it? Because in the document, review of PSBs runs to 70 odd pages. I mean, you talk about public service media. 
So you're obviously widening the definition there. And, and there has been disquiet and the suggestion that this could give the government um, wider scope to, for instance, top slice a little bit more of the BBC license fee to spread a little bit more widely. Why did you make that definition change? Because it's clear that some of those who are on the government's own review looking into PSBs believe that kind of, of, of descriptive change is actually necessary. Yeah, no, I mean, look, the 70 pages, you always get plenty of content from Ofcom, and there were many, many annexes as well, so <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you for reading it. Um, but, um, no, look, I mean, what does it mean to move from PSB to PSM? I mean, on one level, this is quite simple. It's just that traditional linear broadcasting, while actually it's still going pretty strongly, and, and you know, plenty of people who love still, in fact, lots of us who still love to know what's on right now and what I might have missed last night, mm. uh, whether it's on traditional sort of technology platforms or whether it's on IP, it's, it's still much loved, linear broadcasting. But increasingly, we're all getting content through catch up, through all sorts of different platforms. So it's partly about just recognizing that shift. I mean, we said in our report that, you know, there's a lot that the industry is really strong on and there's no other country, there's a very, very interesting international review that we published actually done for us by Ernst & Young, there's no other country that's got the ecology of, of, of public service media content and organisations that the UK has got. No one else has got commercial players uh, or companies operating commercially off a government balance sheet like Channel 4 that are alongside the BBC, the, the national play, you know, it just doesn't exist anywhere else. And that is, that is hugely strong. And the institutions and their brands and the trust that, that, that we've, we've all built in those institutions over many years will carry us forward a long way, but it might not reach everybody. And we have to be alive to the fact that particularly younger viewers, certain communities that just aren't as engaged in more mainstream products, you know, how do we cater for them in the, in the, in the, you know, inc as increasingly it becomes hard to serve everyone? Do we need to think about other forms of getting that content out there, different partnerships, but maybe also other forms of funding, other forms of, of, of supporting production um, and, 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 and broadcasting? What, what kinds of other forms of funding? Yeah, well, you know, in the end, this will be, this will be for the government yeah. to... Um, to uh, you know, to, to think about and look. Having worked in government for many years, you know, you, you ask, you suggest there might be a need for funding, and it often falls on deaf ears in the treasury. Um, but I think you know, um, it can be done through a number of routes. You can have actual government funding, or you can think about commissioning, which has been very successful in the UK, mm. particularly through Channel Four and through the BBC. Yeah. Um, and, and we're not we're not presenting sort of particular models. We're just opening up these as important questions. I think we had a lot of um, you know as you would expect a lot of responses to our consultation warning against top slicing the BBC license fee, and if only for Tim, uh, you know, just to remind you that we did actually point that out in our in our document and say that this was not something that was supported um, by most people. Okay, I mean PSBs they account for what thirty two thousand hours of UK-made original TV productions a year, compared to just 210 hours of UK-produced content available on streaming services, Netflix, and so on. I mean, how do you ensure, having extolled the virtues of, of, of PSBs, I mean, how do you ensure that kind of commitment when the biggest of the PSBs, obviously the BBC, and that's according to the voice of the listener and viewer, has had in real terms public funding cuts for TV, radio, and online services for UK audiences of 25% since 2010, despite significant rises in the cost of producing telly. Mm. I mean, how do you ensure that? Well, look, I mean, in the end, I mean, Tim was talking this morning about, about some of the challenges, you know, from funding, and, and I know that the BBC is in a dialogue with the government about the licence fee in the second half of the charter period, and it's not, it's not, a, it's not an issue that Ofcom's involved in. Um, but what I would say from our perspective is that um, the BBC's remit, and we, you know, we report on how they're doing in uh, achieving against that, the BBC's remit is, is unique really in the UK in needing to serve everyone as far as possible. Most other broadcasters can choose you know, or, or, or are targeting a, 
slightly, to some degree, a, a part of the audience. The BBC has to serve everyone, and you need a certain scale to do that, and a certain range, and a certain uh, economy of scale to be able to deliver into that market. But, but so you know that clearly, clearly funding matters. Um, but I think, you know, and I think the, the BBC, I know, would, would would agree with this that you know that challenge of meeting viewers' expectations in an increasingly diverse set of expectations that people have is actually there regardless of the funding it's just really hard and you know you can see people you know the audience is becoming more fragmented as the range of services that's available to us gets ever more mm. exciting sure sure well one of one of those people who contributed to the psb your psb review said and i quote it's simply not sustainable to continue asking the bbc to produce the same quantity and quality of programming while cutting its revenue you say that you work in partnership with the government mm -hmm. uh, ultimately issues of cost and funding or whatever are for the government but you work in partnership and you present the facts to them do you present that fact do you get it across to them that the bottom line is license fee payers are getting significantly less value from the TV license than they did a decade ago? Well, I mean, uh, I mean, the answer is we do report annually on the BBC and we do bring out all those trends, yes, and you can see that the BBC's had to cut its programming in some areas um, in response to prioritising and, and, and having to, to deal with some of the, the funding issues you're mentioning. We're, we will actually this autumn be, be publishing a five-year view, um, which is a chance to, to take stock a bit and look at how all that is in the round, and I hope that will inform some of the decisions about the BBC's funding, but also particularly the remit for the second half of the charter period but, but is your fear that too many decisions potentially are being made on other grounds beyond the facts and figures that you present that obviously politics might be involved ideology might be involved I mean is, it, is, is that something that, that that concerns you and worries you at well, Ofcom look I mean the, 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 I think when it comes to questions of you know news uh, and, and impartiality, if that's the debate you're, you're sort of referring to, Clive. I think um, we've done research on this, and it shows that um, UK TV news is still highly trusted. And as I said, it's actually, I'm actually risen. Talking, sorry, I'm actually talking about governmental decisions yeah. well, I was when sort it of, comes to funding. Okay. I, I was kind of responding a little bit to what I thought you were talking about in, mm. in terms of sort of impartiality and, and some of the critique that some yeah. would lay. No, I'm talking about government impartiality. Okay, fine. What was your question again? <laughs> <laughs> your job is to present the facts to government. Yeah. And hopefully you want them to act on the facts. Absolutely. Not on ideology and not on politics. No, but look, I mean, they, politicians, you know, I was a civil servant for 30 years. Politicians are elected to make decisions. Yeah. And sometimes the facts give you a really clear uh, direction. But a lot of the time, there's a lot of interpretation and a choice to be made about where to go. And that is what we elect our governments to do. So, you know, as a former civil servant, I would always be really clear that ministers are there to make those decisions. And Ofcom's role is to make sure the evidence is there. And, so, and, and actually, the respect is there, and I think it's there on both sides, that, you know, DCMS, also some other departments, do ask us for the technical work. And I expect as we come into mm. the media bill, we, uh, we will definitely be asked to to you know do the more crunchy work on and some of how this needs to work in practice but there's no interpretation on the fact that British viewers and listeners are not getting the same value for money from the BBC that they got 10 years ago because of real cuts terms real cuts funding in the license fee I just I'm just well, trying to get at, I'm just trying to get at how how much you would push that point push that argument in a discussion I mean is it literally just here are the facts do you decide what you want to do is, is that really all the regulators should be doing well I mean look p people are paying less as you said so it's not necessarily that the value for money has gone down and I think you know um, the BBC would say they've they've delivered very significant efficiencies that have yeah. allowed them to maintain outputs sure. despite having a tighter budget and I mean all all public sector organizations have to accept that their budgets are set by the government. That's that's how it works. And you know, but but of course it's true, and we do point this out that uh, that does require some choices. You can't have everything for free. Um, and at some point, the BBC has to make those choices. And that's why I think the you know questions of being clear about that, being clear about the remit going into the next half of the the charter review. I hope we can inform that 
with this periodic review that we're, that we're mm. going to be doing later this year. Okay. Um, let's talk about Channel 4 and um, possible privatisation. Um, the suggestion is from many, I suspect, in this room and, and, and many in the industry uh, that there is a risk under private ownership. Your Channel 4's duty uh, would be to maximise returns to shareholders. Um, and this is a point the broadcaster itself actually makes in its own defence. Um, surely there would be a temptation to dilute those areas that aren't as commercially viable as others, maintaining a primetime news programme in that slot, for instance. That is a big risk, isn't it? Well, uh, look, the first question that the government needs to, to, to ask and answer, I think, is, is what is Channel 4 for? What does the remit need to be? What, what do we want uh, Channel 4 to deliver against? And, you know, Channel 4 has a very specific place in the PSB ecology at the moment, mm -hmm. um, is particularly strong on delivering for younger viewers. Um, I think four in five, 18 to 34, so subscribe to all four, which is pretty impressive. Um, and we, again, you know, we report very transparently every year on how Channel 4 is doing, and, and our report this summer was really clear that Channel 4 is delivering very well towards a remit that is, is difficult, it's very, very important, and it's very forward-looking about, you know, serving the viewers of, of tomorrow. So, uh, you know, we're, we're definitely clear about some of those about some of those facts. Um, and actually, you know, ministers have been very clear that they think Channel 4 is delivering very well against their remit as well. So, so you know, I think perhaps because Ofcom's put all this on the table very clearly, there's, there's not really a, a debate about that. Yeah. You know, as, as we look forward, you know, there are a number of options here and, and Ofcom may well be asked for advice on some of these. Um, and we need to, you know, we, we need to sort of hold, hold, you know, back from the debate, I think, at this stage and, and be ready mm. to inform it. Um, but those questions of remit, what we want, we should be really clear about that. Um, and, then the, and then, you know, there may well be implications for different models of, of how you would meet that and, 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 and what, what you would be able to achieve. But again, <clears throat> the evidence is there. You've just talked about, you know, how well the channel is doing in terms of reaching sort of wider audiences. The balance sheet is amazing. It's, I mean, if you put those evidence, that evidence in front of someone, they'll say, why the hell are we going to privatise this? You wouldn't do it. You don't need because you don't need to do it. Well, look, the, gov the government has, has said, haven't they? And they they've said this. John Whittingdale said this yesterday uh, that they're looking forward and, and asking questions around sustainability. So their consultation has just closed, literally in the last couple of days. Um, and I'm sure they'll have had a lot of, you know, really good uh, submissions that have been sent in. But that's that's the question they're asking. I think it's a fair question, yeah. um, but it's still pretty early days. Sure. Okay, let's talk about diversity. I, I know this is an issue that, that, that you're passionate about. Ofcom publishes its annual state of diversity in the TV industry uh, in a few weeks, I mm -hmm. think. What's it likely to say? Yeah, well, it's actually a five-year review because we've been doing this now for, for five years. And we've actually, you know, and again, uh, we've seen huge change in those years, I think particularly in the amount of data we've, we've now got to shine a light on what's going on. And, you know, we've seen some improvements, no question of that, but, you know, they're not enough. So, you know, we can see, for example, that um, we've got nearly double the number of people from minority ethnic backgrounds in radio, but we haven't seen the same progress on TV. Um, and actually, the latest Diamond data showed that we're falling back on off-screen uh, representation. Um, on disability, one of the things we'll flag in a few weeks' time is that more and more people are leaving the industry right now, and you're more likely to be disabled, you're more likely to be a woman if you're leaving. I think that's something we need to be really... I'm really looking forward to the next session, actually, mm. uh, and hearing about the disability issues you know, that, that probably lie behind some of those figures. Um, and finally, I would say social class. If you work in TV, you're twice as likely to have been to a private school, twice as likely to have come from a background where your parents had a professional occupation. Mm. So that, I think, class cuts through a lot of these issues and it's, it's, some, it's very hard to measure, uh, but it's something that, um, that we all need to pay a lot more attention to. But are you confident Ofcom itself is diverse enough? I mean, you know, the, the, the media forums that, that, that I'm on, um, which include a lot of black broadcasters and producers and people in the industry, very upset mm. at the Ofcom uh, ruling concerning Piers Morgan, which was uh, about his, 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 his comments and views on, on mental health issues concerning Meghan Markle. But that race element is there. And, and, you know, their sense was that actually it's too white an organization. I would never understand where 
um, that, why that ruling is so upsetting to so many people? So look, is Ofcom diverse enough? No, we've got some really stretching targets. We've actually, we're actually making really good progress in the last year or so. I've, I've, I've you know, basically really cracking the whip on us making progress ourselves as an organization. On the decision around uh, Good Morning Britain, I mean, look, uh, this, was a, this was quite a finely balanced decision. And actually, we were really clear that uh, we were pretty, you know, we were pretty critical of Piers Morgan and some of the things he said had the capacity to be harmful uh, as well as deeply offensive. And we got a lot of complaints, and clearly there was offence for for many viewers. But at the same time, there was a there was pretty robust challenge from a number of presenters to some of the things that he said. And that didn't happen by accident. It happened because ITV designed the program that way and made sure that that challenge was going to be there. So in the end, the decision is about was ITV in breach of the broadcasting code? No, but we were pretty critical of, of, of Piers's comments. I mean, more generally, we really do always have freedom of expression at the heart of what we're doing when we're making decisions about TV complaints. And, you know, sometimes people are going to not like our decisions, but it's really important that, you know, Viewers are entitled to receive and broadcasters are entitled to transmit a range of views and opinions, but it's all about how that's done, the context, and how the programme's put together. Okay. Uh, time for some questions, uh, if we've got any in the audience. Yeah, at the, at the front here, and if you could just give us your name and where you're from, that would be great. Thank you. Yes, yes, a lady there. Hello, uh, Tara Conlan, RTF, Guardian. Mark Thompson said in an earlier um, session that he thought that the um, competition authorities and regulators um, think uh, small. Uh, I wonder what you thought of his comments there. Um, but also, he was talking in relation to uh, Kangaroo, and with the PSBs working on the offspring of that, this single streaming app, I don't know what it's called, Britflix or whatever it's going to be called, but I wondered what you thought of the idea of that, please. Mm. Yeah, no, look, regulators and competition authorities mustn't think small. I mean, increasingly what we're finding, and it's true across all the sectors Ofcom regulates, um, that you have companies that are big in terms of the British market, the UK market, but they're small uh, sometimes in relation to the global players, and that's, that's true in telecoms as well as in, um, as well as in broadcasting. Um, so we mustn't think small, and we have to think ahead as far as we possibly can. Look, the, the, the kangaroo decision is quite a long time ago now. It was a decision by the competition authorities. Um, uh, we haven't got any specific proposals for the future, but what we did say in our uh, public service media review is that we really support uh, strong collaborative partnerships now across the industry. We think that's really essential. And we've been very encouraged, actually, by what we've seen recently with some of the deals that have been struck between, say, Sky and Channel 4, Sky and the BBC, and actually working out how you're going to get prominence for PSB content in a way that really works um, on these new platforms that are coming through. Okay, is there a gentleman there? Hello, can you, um, um, hello, it's Alex from Broadcast Magazine. Um, Melanie, I'd just like to pick up on something you mentioned then regards Channel 4 privatisation and the fact that the government is considering its decision based on the sustainability of the business. However, it's failed to produce any evidence to support this. Have you been asked to produce any evidence to feed into government regards the sustainability, and if not, are you surprised that government hasn't asked you to produce such evidence, given your role? And what is your view on the sustainability of Channel 4, given your excellent you know, market view over the years? Well, look, so I, I'm, no, I'm not surprised we haven't been asked for any uh, input from the government yet. It's still pretty early days. They've launched their consultation. It's quite early on in the process. Um, they may well ask us for views on any number of things, uh, either on a specific set of proposals or in general on, on future trends. 
you know, on sustainability, I think what we, what we have to say there is really already set out in our public service media report, which is more about the industry as a whole um, and, you know, about, about the challenges and the, and the need for investment as, as we switch into, as we, as we transition to digital, something which, of course, Channel 4 is actually, you know, making pretty good headway on. Um, and, you know, the challenges of having content be discoverable uh, and be able to get the revenue streams from that in a world where there is so much competition for viewer eyeballs. Um, but, I, I mean, those, 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 those are the challenges for all broadcasters, I think, even the BBC, because it's the same imperative of being able to defend the licence fee. Is that sustainability is government, the sustainability is at the heart of its decision, and, you know, you guys are responsible for look, ass assessing the health of the, of the broadcaster. Okay, very briefly, May. Well, I mean, look, we might get asked for, for, for more, uh, you know, advice. If we, if, we, if we are asked, we will publish everything okay. that we're, we're asked to provide, but we haven't been yet. All right. I'm going to have to end it there. That flew by. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks very much indeed. Melanie, thank you, thank too. You.